Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict's Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are catholicism.org and reconquest.net. My email address is bam at catholicism.org. I can also be found easily on Twitter at brother underscore Andre and on Facebook. The topic this evening is true or false pope. My guest tonight for all three segments is Mr. John Salsa, a practicing attorney for over 20 years and a widely acclaimed Catholic apologist, writer, and speaker. He's the author of 11 books on a variety of Catholic subjects, most recently, True or False Pope, a 700-page work which he co-authored with Mr. Robert Sisko. And un- unlike the normal uh, procedure for Reconquest, um, Mr. Sells is going to be on all three uh, segments of this and on the subsequent um, episode of Reconquest because we have a lot of ground to cover. And what we're going to be talking about is specifically the phenomenon of sedevacantism, which um, I'll have Mr. Salsa explain so that uh, you, you get less of me and more of our guest. Um, good evening, Mr. Salsa. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, brother. Thank you for having me. Um, so why don't we just jump right into the subject? It's a big subject, and, and you and I kind of talked about it by email ahead of time, and uh, we know we have a lot of ground to cover. So can you tell our listeners what sedevacantism is and what is the root of its error? Yes, Brother Andre, sede vacante from the Latin, you know, sede, seat or chair, vacante, empty or vacant, It's this novel, you know, frankly, novel anti-Catholic thesis, which holds that any Catholic can decide for himself whether the Pope who was elected Pope and presented to and accepted by the Church as such is a true and lawful Pope, just because one personally discerns that he's a heretic. And and most claim that the seat has been vacante, uh, vacant since Pius XII, given the destruction that has occurred within the church, uh, beginning with the pontificate of John the 23rd. So really, this is an error that was invented in the 1970s as an overreaction to the crisis in the church. And it's no different uh, in many respects uh, than than Protestantism, because they all have their various different theories about how a pope falls from office, when he does, they all disagree amongst themselves. In fact, many of them have even elected their own popes. And so they're, they're, they would be called conclavist sedevacantists, those who've convened their, their own conclaves. But, you know, in terms of the root error, I, I would say, brother, that the, the, the root error, uh, which is you know, private judgment, but it's really the same as what the conservative Catholics are, conservative Catholic friends. That's an exaggerated notion of papal infallibility. And so they have the same major premise, right, that whatever comes from the Pope must be true and good. It must be infallible. But their minor premise is different. The conservatives would say, because all of these reforms and and teachings were approved by the Pope, it follows that they must be true and good. Now, the state of a contest, using the same major premise, have a different minor. Their minor is because the things that have come out since the council are harmful and erroneous that they could not have come from a true pope, you see? And so they both uh, make the error of excess. And, and, and how to understand this is their major premise is wrong. Not everything that the pope teaches, that, that he says that he does, is necessarily true, good, and infallible. The premise has to be qualified to say that when the pope invokes his infallibility, and that's been clearly defined by the first Vatican Council and those parameters, it is then and only then that he is guaranteed to be giving us the truth, to be giving us what's good and true and infallible. If not, if he does not invoke his infallibility, if he does not meet these parameters, then he is susceptible to error. doesn't mean that he will necessarily err, but he is susceptible to it. And so... We also point out, uh, brother, in the book, and the Sede Vicantis, we don't believe they knew about this until we published it, but the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople actually condemned the Sede Vicantis thesis. 
uh, by excommunicating whoever would separate from their bishop without a formal judgment of, of the church. This has been confirmed throughout the church, throughout history. It was most recently confirmed by Pope Benedict XV explicitly in, in ex quo. And I'll, I'll just finish the introduction by pointing also out to the First Vatican Council, um, who declared that the, the seat of Peter uh, lasts beyond Peter's death, and the state of a contest will admit that the council at least teaches that. But the council also said that that seat will always have perpetual successors. That is, that the church will always be able to produce a pope, which she has throughout her time. Otherwise, what what good is the chair, right? The, 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 and, and, and so the, the, the root error, again, is an exaggerated notion of papal infallibility and a denial of what the church has taught concerning uh, both the uh, constant succession of popes that we will have and the fact that Catholics cannot, by their own private judgment, decide who is a true pope and who is not. Now, the council that you were citing there was Vatican I, right? The, on That's the, correct. On the, on the perpetual succession. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, the, the, by the way, Benedict the XV, um, whom you just named, was one of the greatest canonical minds in the history of the church. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the 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 state of Vicantes tend to. I'm sorry. Did you say fifteenth or fourteenth? I said fifteenth. Yes. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm I my mistake because I I'm, I was talking about the fourteenth. Uh huh. I was going to say the state of Vicantes often fancy themselves great canonists. Um, so okay, so we 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 get the root of the error, uh, private judgment, and also that the, the church has already anticipated this in in a sense, saying that the the, the church herself has to adjudicate this. Um, in your book, you claim that state of Vicantism violates the church's attributes. Could mm. you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, brother. The, the church has uh, certain properties. They're permanent qualities. And she has four marks, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And she has three attributes which perfect her nature. And they are her infallibility, her indefectibility, and her visibility. And the Sede Vicantis thesis practically denies all three. Certainly it exaggerates the notion of infallibility, but it also denies the, the attribute of indefectibility, uh, that the Church will exist until the end of time, because Sede Vicantis practically say that the Catholic Church somehow morphed into a new Church after the election of John the Twenty Third, and now we really don't know where it is other than it resides in the hearts and minds of of true Catholics, and that gets to this uh, rejection of the notion of visibility. And this is an important thing to understand for Catholics. When we talk about the Church being visible, we're referring not just to the fact that it has visible members, because other religions, the false religions, they also have visible members. So material visibility deals with what the senses perceive. Yes, there are certain people, they worship a certain way. But it's the formal visibility that the Sede Vicantis thesis rejects, because formal visibility concerns what the religion is. And we know what the Catholic religion is by understanding that it is a visible social unit constituted by a pope at the top with a hierarchy of bishops, priests, deacons, there's religious, there's laity. And so it's the visible social unit which gives us the formal visibility of the Catholic Church that is a permanent quality that will exist until the end of time. And if you listen to the Sede Vicantis, and we quote from them very directly, they are forced to revert to the Protestant definition of an invisible church with visible members. Why? Because they reject the visible social unit. They deny that formal visibility exists because they deny that the visible social unit exists of a pope with a hierarchy, and hence they're again forced to resort to the Protestant definition, and this is why we say that they reject visibility. So, and so the the the, the visible church can't be a bunch of independent Sede Vicantis chapels, half of which have excommunicated the other half. I mean, because the, the, these these folks always differ with each other, right? That's that's correct, and. You can't look at a Sede Vicantis chapel and know that it's Catholic without understanding it in the context of the church proper, which is the pope and the bishops and the hierarchy. And it's that visible social unit that the Sede Vicantis reject because they can't point to where it is. And, and, and Vatican I actually said that the pope, the papacy, was the principle of the church's visibility as well as of her unity, right? 
In, indeed, and that's why he's at the top of the chain of the visible social unit. And so when you kick out the man at the top of the chain, what do you have left? Well, they've decided that they're not only, uh, the sea is not only vacant, but the church is vacant. We can almost say that they're ecclesia of a contest, so to speak, mm-hmm. because they reject not just the Pope, but the entire hierarchy. All right, so um, it explains the church, it, it denies the church's attributes, um, it denies the church's marks. How does it, how does it also deny the, church, the, the, the four marks of the church, the one holy yeah, Catholic? Yeah, when we say one holy Catholic and apostolic, you know, briefly we can say that the church will always be one in her doctrine, and that means in her infallible dogmas, okay? And so therefore there will never be a formal, formal rupture within the church, that's not possible because it could only happen where the, if the Pope were to impose a heresy upon the church as a matter of faith, but Christ's promise that the gates of hell will not prevail, he made that promise in the context of the Pope's authority to bind and loose, that is to bind the faithful to what we know need to know for our salvation, which is the dogmas of the faith. So while there may be material divisions Within the church, and we certainly have this today with the modernist errors that are in in the church, that will not destroy the oneness of the church. We've had this before. I mean, we've had the Arian heresy. We've had the Great Western Schism. These were material divisions that will never destroy the church's oneness. She's holy. Well, she's produced saints after Vatican II, like Padre Pio. She's Catholic. And this is another important point. When we say that the church is Catholic— It means that she not only is Catholic in a right, which means she has the ability to spread all over the world, but in fact she will spread throughout the world. And the theologians refer to this as a moral Catholicity, which means that the Catholic Church will never be reduced to just a few members. That is in her membership. Now there's a distinction there, brother, as you well know, between church membership and those who have the supernatural virtue of faith, right? I mean, when our Lord said, when I come, will he find faith? He was referring to the supernatural virtue of faith. How many have faith? That's known to God alone. But moral Catholicity deals with the the truth that the church will always have a visible membership, large members. Whether or not they have divine faith is another question, but they will it won't be reduced to just a few members because that would deny Catholicity. And then, and then finally, and I think very damning is the state of Acantis practical rejection of apostolic succession which means that the church will always have legitimate successors to the apostles. Now, there's a formal and and material distinction here as well. When we talk about material succession to uh, to the apostles, that is the physical connection that the bishops today have with with the apostles. This deals with the, the power of orders, the power of sanctifying. However, formal succession deals with their jurisdiction, uh, their authority to teach and govern. And the the dogma of the church is that the church will always have legitimate bishops with ordinary jurisdiction. And as Pius XII teaches, that ordinary jurisdiction comes from the pope. That's what distinguishes the Catholic bishops from, let's say, the Eastern schismatics. There may be material succession there, but there's no formal succession because there's no ordinary jurisdiction. That comes from the Pope alone. And if we do not have a Pope and haven't had a Pope since Pius XII, where's the jurisdiction coming from? Where's mm-hmm. ordinary jurisdiction? You know, some state of a contest have said, well, there's got to be a bishop in the woods somewhere that was consecrated by, by Pius XII. Of course, that's an argument of silence. They can't prove it. They would also have to show that such a person was never a member of the new church, that there's a state of a contest bishop uh, somewhere. Uh, they can't prove that. But even, the, even that brother would still violate the mark of Catholicity, right? Because it'd be reducing the church to effectively one prelate. Yeah, and, and, and visibility the, too. And, and visibility yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say it would deny the attribute of visibility, you know? And so in my discussion with State of a Contest, they have to rationalize this by saying, yeah, there must be a Pius XII bishop in chain somewhere in Korea. It's an utter absurdity. It practically denies the teaching of Pius XII that ordinary jurisdiction comes from the Pope. And this is a doctrine that Father Shikata himself has denied, and this is the only way they can get around their practical denial of the uh, apostolic succession. And the, and, the, and the bishops of the Society of St. Pius X are the faithful who worship at chapels like that, that aren't St. Vicantus, but are, 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 are going to bishops that don't have ordinary jurisdiction. They don't buy into this argument of the St. Vicantus because they, they well know that ordinary jurisdiction has to come from the Pope. 
it absolutely has to come from the Pope. And we've always maintained that prior to uh, the current Pope, you know, giving ordinary jurisdiction to the priests, they were operating uh, under supply jurisdiction, in which case the, the church supplies, but that's not going to benefit the state of Acontis because that only applies to Catholics uh -huh. and, and, and in the objective order anyway. Sede Vicantis would be considered schismatics because they reject the authority of the Pope and those in communion with him. Again, I'm not talking about the subjective level, level or culpability, but on the objective order, they wouldn't have supplied jurisdiction either because they're outside the church. Yeah, at least materially, they're schismatics. I mean, they fit the definition. Correct. You're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre interview and my guest, Mr. John Salsa, about True or False Pope, his recent book. Um, so... John, there's a there's a distinction between the internal and the external bonds of unity in the church. The church is one. We've already talked about the mark of unity. How do the external and internal bonds of unity with the church reveal the errors of state of contests? Yeah, we thought that this was important material to cover, to provide a foundation for the understanding of where they err when they say that the sin of heresy causes the loss of office. And we go into quite a bit of ecclesiology in our book, Robert and I do. And we note that there are the internal bonds uh, that a man unites uh, himself to the church. Those are the virtues of faith, hope, and charity that reside in the soul. We might say that those internal bonds unite us to, metaphorically, the soul of the church, right? But there are also external bonds, and the church has been clear what these are. They're the profession of the true faith. They're the participation in the same sacraments, and then thirdly, united to the hierarchy, the pope and the bishops. So there's a threefold uh, external bond that unites one to the church. And what's critical to note is that perfect observance of these unities is not required for church membership. So one can be in a state of mortal sin, let's say, and still be a member of the church. He's still a member of the body. He may have severed himself um, uh, from the soul of the church, but he would still be a member of the body, even an occult heretic, right? Even one who is a formal heretic, that is, he's committed uh, the sin of heresy internally by an act of his will. Even he, although he has severed himself from the soul of the church because he's lost all the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, unless his heresy is public, he remains a member of the church. He remains a member of the body. And hence, those popes who have made heretical statements over the years, those statements alone do not sever themselves uh, from the body. Maybe they've lost the interior virtue of faith. Maybe they're not united to the soul. God knows. But the heretical statements alone do not sever them from the body. It's only according to the church's judgment. And, and what we thought it was important to, to qualify is when we talk about the profession of faith, that first external bond, that doesn't mean that every Catholic professes the, the faith with, with complete clarity. How many of us have made materially heretical statements, right? I mean, if everybody sure. who made a, her, a materially heretical statement was a heretic, the church wouldn't have many members. What the profession of the true faith means is that the person acknowledges the church as the infallible rule of faith. That's the key. So to the extent that these popes have and they have acknowledged the church as the infallible rule of faith, their materially heretical statements alone do not sever them from the body. So would you say that would you say that the uh, the state of a contest is sort of forced to judge the internal forum of a pope and say um, he has he has formally assented to this heresy with his will and and, and therefore yeah. excommunicated himself? Absolutely, and this is what we point out over and over again. The sin of heresy, sin is a matter of the internal form. It's not a matter of the external form unless it becomes public. But then we're talking about not the sin, but the crime. This is the key distinction. Sin is a matter of the internal form, and the church, even the church, doesn't judge internals. And no theologian in the world has ever said that the sin of heresy alone causes the loss of office. In fact, as we'll probably get to, Bellarmine explicitly rejected this opinion in his De Romano Pontifice. So it's a matter of the internal form, uh, and, and ver the virtue of faith is not required for membership. Again, it's only when the sin is adjudicated by the church in the external form as criminal, 
And that's when both the material element of heresy and the formal element of heresy, which is the subjective will, the pertinacity, only when that is established by the church in the ecclesiastical form is then the man severed from the body of the church. So there's a distinction there between an individual's private speculations versus the public judgment of the church. And, and of course, it would be very difficult. I mean, the, the, the standard is set very high. The bar is very high for saying that a pope has pertinaciously resisted Catholic teaching when he is the highest authority in the church. Yeah, and I, and I would even say, brother, that even the material element is about the highest bar that, that you have to overcome, because when you're talking about heresy, the Sede Vicantis and even other traditional Catholics, they use that word really loosely. But we have a chapter in our book that talks about all of the lesser theological errors and censures, and most of these errors are not heretical. They fall into a lesser uh, uh, category of, of error. A heresy is a direct denial or doubt, but it's it's directly contradictory to an article of the faith, right? So if the Pope would come out and say, there are four persons in the Blessed Trinity. That's, of course, materially heretical. But some of the things that they say, it takes extra steps of reason, you know, to conclude that there's heresy. And in fact, the Sede Vicantist writer himself, John Daly, said that where you require extra steps of reasoning to reach a conclusion that something's heretical, it's going to fall, uh, it's going to, fall to a degree less than heresy because it's not a direct denial or doubt. You see, it's only indirect. So that's an important distinction to make. But then, as you said, if a material statement, a heretical statement is, is made in the public form, and you still have to judge the, the subjective element, which is pertinacity. And that's only established after the church establishes that he's been warned and he still perseveres in his error. All right. I think we're going to end our first segment here. Um, everyone hold on to after the break, and we'll be joined again by Mr. John Salsa to discuss his book, True or False Pope. Stick around. Welcome back to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are catholicism.org and reconquest.net. My email address is bam at catholicism.org. I'm easily found on Twitter at brother underscore Andre and on Facebook. We're continuing tonight our subject, True or False Pope, an interview with our guest, Mr. John Salsa, a practicing attorney and Catholic apologist, writer, and speaker, the author of 11 books, including True or False Pope, which is a 700-page work that he has recently co-authored with Mr. Robert Sisko. So we're going to hop right back into the subject and talking about um, sort of the, the Sede Vicantist as canonist. A lot of, of Sede Vicantists, as I mentioned earlier, love to quote canon law and use uh, legal arguments to support their theory. Uh, one of these comes from Canon 188.4, of course, of the old code. They wouldn't accept John Paul II's 1983 code of canon law as coming from a real pope. Um, how do they use this, uh, John, to support their position, and can you explain why this is an error? Yes, brother. Uh, canon 188.4 uh, says that no declaration uh, for a cleric is required if he has publicly defected from the faith. And using this canon, the Sede Vicantis conclude that, well, because these conciliar popes have defected from the faith, the church does not have to declare them a heretic, which means I get to. I get to do it by my own private judgment. I mean, this is completely far-fetched. They, they misunderstand the canon. When the canon says public defection, and both the canon and commentaries on the 17 Code of Canon Law say that means that the person has joined a non-Catholic religion. Again, this is in canon law and commentary. Uh, they've joined a non-Catholic religion. And if a pope were to join a non-Catholic religion, why wouldn't a declaration be required? Well, the reason would be is because the church would no longer recognize him as pope, and they would no longer tolerate him as pope. Which means that, on the, on the flip side, so long as a pope is tolerated, even if he's making materially heretical statements, he's still the pope. So this canon does not at all apply to the conciliar popes because none of them have publicly defected from the faith. They all, as I've mentioned before, maintain that the church is the infallible rule of faith, even though they may have made material errors or heresies, they're not considered public defectors. And, and guess what? 
even if one were to publicly defect from the faith, that same code of canon law, this 1917 code under canon 2314, still requires a canonical warning for clerics before the church would hold them to be publicly defecting from the faith. And so even if a pope were to, they would still be required to have a canonical warning. And of course, this hasn't happened. So even if they did publicly defect, warnings haven't been issued. I'd also mention that under the 83 code, and you're right to say they wouldn't accept it, but even under the 83 code, not only is a warning required, but a declaration is required for those who publicly defect from the faith. So the bottom line is, because these conciliar popes haven't defected from the faith, they haven't joined a non-Catholic religion, the canon that they cite is completely irrelevant. And of course, historically, the Church always in her practice used such declarations to, to, to make it known to the faithful that, you know, this priest or this bishop or whatever is now outside of the Church, he's defected from the faith. Look what they did with Luther, and they yeah. gave him time to retract. I mean, the patience that the Church has had. We give many examples throughout our book. Uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam, Archbishop Darboy, uh, Michel de Bay, uh, a number of prominent clerics over the years who were uttering material heresies and even persisting in their errors after being warned by the Pope. Even in these cases, I can point out the cases with, where Bellarmine was involved, where Pius IX was involved. The Church is very patient, and it's only at the very last minute when there's no hope that the Church then will formally declare someone to have severed the bond with the Church. That's right. Okay, um, good. So, so th th this is um, th this is sort of consistent with. On the one hand, the Sede Vicantis uh, raise the bar of what constitutes the ordin the infallible magisterium. They make the ordinary magisterium all infallible, as if mm -hmm. the additional note of universality isn't necessary for it to be infallible. And then they also um, lower the bar a lot when it comes to the criteria for lay people and independent clerics and so forth judging the Pope, right? So that, that they're constantly lowering the one bar and raising the other. Well, there's no question about that, and brother. We point out that in our book, and we give many examples. One you just mentioned we, we present. Also, public and notorious. For those who say to be conscious to will acknowledge that the heresy has to be public and notorious, well, guess what? They may think these heresies are public, but they can't prove that they're notorious, which means that the guilt, uh, the Pope's culpability, also has to be public and widely known. And so what do they do? They say, well, notorious really isn't required. All we need is public. So there's a constant watering down of church teaching. There's a constant lowering of the bar to justify their thesis. The, the, I recall reading, uh, the Sede Vicantos will say, you know, an occult heretic and a manifest heretic are two different things. And an occult heretic is somebody, as you said, who secretly uh, occult in his internal form only um, holds heresy. But a manifest heretic is one who's made it made it known. Uh, the Sede Vicantos frequently s footnoted uh, a, a doctoral thesis from the Catholic University of America as if it backed up their position. A priest that I knew, is Father, Father Brian Harrison, told me this. He actually looked up that thesis. He got a copy of the thesis, and he discovered that this priest who was getting his, doc, his, his STD or whatever from Catholic University had concluded through canonical studies and standard commentaries on canon law that to be considered a manifest heresy, you had to formally join a non-Catholic sect. Mm. So, so yes. the, the the very thesis that so many of them had footnoted in their works actually totally disproved them. Totally, and that I'm glad you brought it up um, because Bellarmine himself may have held that position. When you look at Bellarmine's De Romano Pontifice, when he talks about the manifest heretic, he uses terms like one who separates himself and turns away from the church. And he uses an example of novation. Now, novation was somebody who didn't just utter material heresies. He actually defected from the church. He rejected the authority uh, and the papacy of Pope Cornelius, and in fact, eventually declared himself Pope. Yeah, he became and an so when, when, when Bellarmine uses the word manifest heretic, one can make the argument that he's not simply referring to one who holds a heresy in the public external forum, but one who's actually completely defected from the church and joined a non-Catholic religion. So if Pope Francis became a Baptist preacher tomorrow, then, then we could safely say that he is yeah. a manifest heretic. And that, that may happen. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
but but in, but until it does, you know, he's not a heretic according to the public judgment of the mm-hmm. church, and that's what's key. Now, uh, another another big uh, argument, sort of canonical style argument that the um, Zedivicantes use, and in fact, it seems to be their weapon of mass destruction, as far as I can tell, is the decree cum ex apostolatus by Pope Paul the Fourth. It's um, this from fifteen fifty nine. Why is this not a uh, a cogent argument for Zedivicantism? What's the error here? Yeah, cum ex shouldn't be a weapon of mass destruction, but a weapon of mass em- embarrassment for them to use it. I mean, because it, it actually supports the recognize and resist position. You know, we think that Paul IV, it's commonly believed that he uh, promulgated this legislation, which is w- what it was to prevent Carlo Marone uh, from being elected because they thought he was a heretic. But what cum ex first says is that it's licit. It's licit to contradict a pope who deviates from the faith. Well, that's precisely what the recognize and resist position is. And then it goes on to hold that it says if prior to the election uh, someone deviated from the faith or fallen into heresy, the election is void. But here's what the state of Acontis missed. There's actually two points. Number one, the heresy had to be established by the church, not by private judgment. The heresy had to first be adjudicated by the church in the ecclesiastical forum. As St. Thomas says, you know, the public judgment must come from public authority. And in our book, we cite canonists at the time Cumex was issued, such as Borgesius and Massa. They both said, and we have quotes from them, that there had to be an ecclesiastical finding of fact and conviction of heresy as a condition for the prescriptions of Cumex Apostolatus uh, to take fact, uh, take effect. That's the first point. The second point is that this was a disciplinary bull of penal legislation, and it's been overturned by canon law. And we have many canonists who, who, who uh, prove that point. Cardinal Hergenrother, who was a scholar and cardinal prefect of the Vatican Archives of the time, he specifically noted that cum ex was merely legislation and it wasn't infallible. So number one, it doesn't apply. And number two, if it did apply theoretically, legally, it still wouldn't apply factually to the current popes because the church hasn't found them guilty of the crime of heresy. Now, I, I recall reading that Pope St. Pius V, before he was Pope, of course, he was an inquisitor. Um, uh, he was a Dominican and he was an inquisitor during the Protestant um, uh, so-called Reformation. And one of his jobs as inquisitor was to go around basically applying cum ex apostolatus, right? It, so, in other words, this is an, a proof that there was a, this need to adjudicate, that it wasn't yes. private judgment. Correct. It, it, it proves that a very high cleric in the church had to have an ecclesiastical finding of fact according to the church's judgment before the crime of heresy would be established, within, which under that current legislation would be an impediment to election, although that's no longer the legislation, that's no longer the case. And I'm assuming you go into cum ex apostolatus uh, exhaustively in your book, right? Exhaustively in a number of different places throughout the book, yes. Great. Now, um, Sedevicantists are constantly referring to the great Saint Robert Bellarmine, whom, whose name's popped up already a couple of times. Can you give us a summary of Saint Robert Bellarmine's commentary regarding those five opinions about a heretical pope and why the Sedevicantists have erred regarding Saint Robert Bellarmine as if he's one of them? This is a very significant issue. Robert Bellarmine, a great saint and doctor of the church, wrote a treatise called De Romano Pontifici, in which he commented on five different opinions concerning a heretical pope. And for years, for years, the state of the contest have cut and pasted Bellarmine's fifth opinion on their websites, and they've avoided all the others, primarily the second and third opinion. And I'm going to explain why that is, because the second and third opinion that Bellarmine commented on completely negate the Sede Vicantis thesis. In fact, most recently, we've obtained uh, an English translation of the uh, of the five opinions from Ryan Grant and the Sede Vicantis, Mario Dirksen of Novus Ordo Watch was one of them who received Mr. Grant's translation and put it on his website. Well, we discovered, although we took a screenshot of it before, Dirksen deleted the second and the third opinion from his website. And Father Chicada has done the same. He's avoided the same. And I'll tell you why. And very briefly, the first opinion is that a pope cannot fall into heresy. Well, we're assuming that's the case, so we can move on to the second opinion. In Bellarmine's second opinion, the second opinion is that the pope loses his office immediately for heresy as a sin against divine law. 
Well, you've heard that before, and you've heard that from Seda Vacantis. Bellarmine says he rejects that opinion. And in fact, he says this opinion is rejected by all the theologians, that if one is a, an occult heretic, he can still remain a member of the church. Now, the Seda Vacantis never quote this opinion, uh, Bellarmine's comments, because it's what they believe. They believe that under the, the sin of heresy theory invented by Father Chicada that a pope would lose his office. Well, Bellarmine rejected it. So, so c- can I just cut in here? Uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, as a theologian, is going to be sort of like St. Thomas did. He's going to be giving an opinion, and he may or may not agree with it. He's going to state the opinion or maybe an objection or something, and then yes. either refute it or accept it as his own opinion. So these five opinions, it's not like St. Robert, some people might be listening if they're not familiar and think that St. Robert Bellarmine was, was, you know, somehow very confused and he had five opinions that contradicted each other. Each other all at the same time, but he yes. he simply distinguished five five possibilities. He distinguished five possibilities. Yeah, as I said at the beginning, he he gave a commentary on the five opinions. He rejected, you know, two, three, four, and then he finally adopted five. I'll, I'll I'll get to that, brother. Where there's a unanimous opinion that the church has to f- determine the crime before a pulp a pope would fall from heresy. That that's an important point to note. But I'm bringing this up because, as you said. The state of a contest attempt to use Bellarmine in support of my position. And so what I'm trying to show our, our listeners is that Bellarmine actually rejected the state of a contest position in opinion two. So the second opinion is the opinion Bellarmine rejected, which says that a pope loses his office immediately for heresy when the pope commits a sin against divine law. Now, Bellarmine rejected this opinion, but it's it's exactly the opinion that the state of Vicantis hold, that the Pope loses his office for the sin of heresy. And this is why the state of Vicantis never quote from this uh, opinion, Bellarmine's commentary on this opinion, because that's precisely what they believe. And this is why Mario Dirksen of Novus Ordo Watch deleted the second opinion uh, from his website. So they quote they quote the opinion, but they don't quote him disagreeing with it. Yes, they, they will not quote. And in fact, they just want to eliminate the whole thing because they don't want to figure out what they don't want to reveal what Bellarmine said about it. They'll focus exclusively on on the fifth opinion. But that's right. I mean, this, the Bellarmine's commentary in his rejection of the second opinion is a rejection of the primary thesis of Sadomacantism, that the pope loses his office for the sin of heresy. Bellarmine rejects that opinion. Mm. Bellarmine also rejects the third opinion. And the third opinion is that a true pope can never lose his office for manifest heresy because he cannot be judged by the church. Now, again, Bellarmine rejected this opinion. In fact, he explicitly states in his rejection of this opinion that heresy is the one exception where a pope can be judged. He specifically says a pope can be judged in the case of heresy. Right, and this is also why the Sadie Vicantis have deleted this opinion from their commentaries and their websites. You won't see the second or third opinion anywhere, um, and that's because Bellarmine is clear; he rejects those opinions. Now, the fourth opinion is something that they will present. The fourth opinion says this: it says a pope. And I'm just summarizing: a pope is not ipso facto deposed, but he must be deposed by the church. This was actually the opinion, uh, the opinion of Cajetan. Now, two points here. The first point is that the state of the contest misunderstand the meaning of this opinion. They think that it means that the church deposes the pope. That's not true. The church does not depose the pope. Christ deposes the pope. What the fourth opinion means is that after the church determines the crime, the church participates ministerially in the deposition of the pope by declaring by juridical act that the that the pope must be avoided that he's vitandus he's avoided and hence the church separates from the pope this was the opinion of cardinal cajetan and john of saint thomas and and we note the distinction here the church determines the crime and then cajetan and saint john of saint thomas held that the church then has to declare to the faithful that this pope must be avoided it's the declaration of vitandus to be avoided that is the dispositive cause of the pope losing his office. That is the fourth opinion. I, we call it in our book the Dominican opinion. Yeah, because both and, John, John of St. Thomas and Cajetan were both Dominican Thomas Tom, yes. scholars. Okay, That's right. And so the dispositive cause of the fourth opinion is the church 
participating in the ministerial deposition of the Pope, declaring that he must be avoided under the divine injunction of Titus 3.10, St. Paul telling Titus, avoid him after two warnings. And then, once the dispositive cause is established by the Vitandus Declaration, Christ is the efficient cause, and Christ then comes in and severs the bond between the man and the papacy, between the matter and the form. And Seda Vicantis have never made this distinction uh, between dispositive cause and efficient cause, and they've also completely misunderstood the meaning of the fourth opinion. That's the first point on the fourth opinion. I do want to mention another error that Seda Vicantis make on the fourth opinion. And when I say Seda Vicantis, I'm referring to Father Chicada, Mario Dirksen, and John Lane, and others. They put Francisco Suarez into the category of the fourth opinion. And then they go on to say, well, Suarez was wrong, even though they misunderstood the opinion, and Bellarmine was right because Bellarmine's a doctor of the church, and we hold his opinion. Well, Suarez did not hold the fourth opinion. He held the fifth opinion with Robert Bellarmine. They held the same opinion, and that was the fifth opinion. And the fifth opinion simply says that a manifest heretic loses his office ipso facto. In Latin, it means by the fact. But by the fact is what is established by the church who determines the crime. So both the fourth opinion, the Dominican opinion, and the fifth opinion, which we call the Jesuit opinion, Bellarmine and Suarez, they both hold that the church determines the crime. The difference between the fourth opinion is that in the fourth opinion, the church goes on to declare vitandus, and that's the dispositive cause of the loss of office. Whereas in the fifth opinion, the Jesuits simply said after the church, church determines the, the crime, that's the dispositive cause, and Christ comes in and severs. So there's no need for a further ministerial participation in the deposition. That's the distinction between the fourth and the fifth, but both opinions require the judgment, the public judgment of the church. And I can prove what I'm saying by Suarez by simply quoting him. Suarez, on the one hand, and we have the references in our book, he says that he see, and I'm quoting, he ceases to be pope when a just sentence is passed for his crime. He's referring to to the church determining the crime, which is the dispositive cause of the fifth opinion. But then he goes on to say, and I'm quoting, he is, quote, immediately deposed by Christ. You see? So that's where there's a distinction there between the church declaring the crime as dispositive cause and Christ severing the bond as efficient cause, but it's based upon the determination of the crime. And that is the unanimous opinion of all of the scholars that we've studied. And finally, I'll close by saying that John of St. Thomas and Cardinal Journet, as recently as Cardinal Journet, both held that Bellarmine and Suarez agreed, that they both held the same opinions. So the Sedevacantists have not only misunderstood the fourth and the fifth opinion, but they've mistakenly put Suarez into the fourth opinion when he actually held the fifth. Okay, John, we're going to go to break now, and when we return, I want to ask you a couple of questions about what you just said. Okay, uh, please stick around. You're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. Welcome back to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie, your host. Uh, for this final segment, I'm still interviewing Mr. John Salsa on his book, True and or False Pope, which is about Sedevicantism and the error of Sedevicantism. Um, John, you were talking about uh, the five opinions of, of uh, St. Robert Bellarmine and uh, where Suarez, his fellow Jesuit, weighed in on these things. And you're saying that the St. Vicantus sort of misrepresent both of them, both of these Jesuits. Um, basically, just to sort of bubble up to the top and, and, and to get out of some of the beautiful scholastic distinctions that we get between um, the dispositive cause and the efficient cause of the Pope's deposition and all this, um, all of which is beautiful and appropriate in, in, in Catholic scholastic theology. No matter what, consistently, all of these theologians, these doctors, including doctors of the church, say that this is something that has to be adjudicated by the church, right? They all do. There's not one single detractor. I mean, from Cajetan to Bellarmine to Suarez to John of St. Thomas to, to Father Paul Lehman, and we go on and on and on. 
they're all consistent that the church has to adjudicate. And remember, it's ultimately based on divine revelation, on okay. St. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 310, where he says, after the first and second admonition, avoid the heretic. Well, and, and the admonition's not from ju just from Joe Catholic. The admonition is from somebody with authority. Absolutely, and we prove that in our, our book, brother. We go through a number of, uh, of authorities that say, of course, St. Paul is referring to the authority of the church. St. Thomas himself says that Titus 3.10 is, is divine revelation's foundation for the canonical proceedings that, that flow from uh, uh, the requirement to first warn, to establish pertinacity. And in fact, in De Romano Pontifice, when Bellarmine advances his opinion, which he accepts the fifth opinion, he says... It's based on Titus 3.10 and warnings. And so through the ecclesiastical process of warning, the church then establishes pertinacity and determines the fact, ipso facto, by which, according to that opinion, uh, the Pope falls. But Bellarmine is very clear about this, and he's also clear in his other treatise, De Membris Ecclesiae, where he says that people cannot depose their bishops before a public judgment of the mm. church. And, of course, Bellarmine was simply... Uh, reflecting the teaching of Constantinople IV. So Bellarmine's opinion, which the Sede Vicantis have misunderstood, is based upon Titus 3.10, warnings, ecclesiastical process, and the church determining the crime. And that is a unanimous theological opinion. While there's a distinction, as you said, a subtle distinction between the Jesuit and the Dominican opinion concerning dispositive cause versus efficient uh, cause, the unanimous opinion is the church and the church alone must establish the crime of heresy before the Pope would lose his office. Uh, going back to, to the fact that, that uh, St. Paul to Titus is the locus classicus of this uh, argument for deposition, this is, this is, it's important to note, and you're, I mean, aside from this work against state of Vicantism, you're most known in Catholic circles, of course, for Fatima, your Fatima book, but also for being an apologist, for being a Catholic, Catholic versus Protestant kind of apologetics. Um, and as an apologist, I know you're, you're very well aware of the fact that the, the epistle to Titus is St. Paul writing to a bishop. St. Paul's not just writing to, to, to laymen. So in the, in the epistle to Titus, he's, he's telling Titus, this is, your, this is what you're to do as bishop. You admonish and after the uh, first and second admonition avoids, right? So th this is one apostle who was also bishop's mm -hmm. uh, directions to another bishop about his pastoral charge. That really seems simple to us, right, when we read it, but evidently it's something that's been overlooked by the state of a contest. You're right. It's one bishop uh, explaining to another what has to be done in the case of heresy, and it's clear that the warnings have to come from ecclesiastical authority, and, and in our book we prove that. We're not just exegeting the passage on our own, but we prove from St. Thomas and others commentaries, classical commentaries on it, that the church's legislative process for heresy is founded upon Titus 3.10. And that's an important point. So this is something, this is not just a mere question of canon law. This is something of divine foundation. Indeed. So um, what, what you had said regarding um, these five positions of Bellamen and the, the, the Jesuits and the Dominicans um, disagreeing, it, it all amounts to the same thing, really, as it pertains to the Sede Vicantus argument. It is something that absolutely must uh, be adjudicated. It's not a subject of, of private opinion. Now, uh, we have a lot more ground to, discover, uh, to, to cover, so I think we're going to uh, save the other questions till the, the, the second show to the sequel to this, next week's episode. But uh, in the time remaining, which is a little less than three minutes, I'd like to ask you, when you talk about the church declaring a pope to pose, the, the church de declaring the dispositive cause to have been um, met— um, what does that mean? How does that look? I mean, is that is that yes. the College of Cardinals? Is that the clergy of the city of Rome? Who does yes. this? It's a it's the common opinion that we've discovered in our research that would have to happen by an ecumenical council, a gathering of the of the world's bishops. Okay, that would come together and address uh, the material heresies that the Pope uh, has uttered. Um, he would be issued warnings at that time, and then there would be an adjudication, again, by an ecumenical council declaring the crime 
uh, of heresy at that point. Now, it seems logical, um, in my view, that the Dominicans got this right, because if this is going to be an ecumenical council behind closed doors, how, how are the faithful supposed to know what, what the decision is, right? And even Father Paul Lehman and others said, until uh, the church, the faithful, know the Pope is to be avoided, he's still Pope. Mm -hmm. And even though he has uttered heresies, he's still tolerated by the Pope until he either publicly defects or the faithful knows that he's a heretic. Well, the faithful can only know if the church then comes and declares him to be avoided. So well, the distinction is, in the Jesuit opinion, the Pope separates himself from the church after the church determines the crime, whereas in the Dominican opinion, the church separates itself from the Pope by declaring to the faithful that he must be avoided. And through that declaration, then, the Pope is effectively rendered impotent because the faithful will no longer tolerate him as Pope and, and follow him as Pope. He can't he cannot uh, govern anymore in his capacity, and that's when Christ severs the bond. It's a subtle distinction, but the bottom line is these opinions completely, the fourth and the fifth, and the second and the third, as I mentioned, completely decimate the state of the conscious position of private judgment. Well, I think, I think we, we, we've covered a lot of ground there, and I look forward to our, our sequel to the next episode when we're going to cover even more ground. And specifically, we're going to talk about some... Uh, particular sedevic contests, as well as their 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 arguments and some of the sort of intellectual dishonesty that you've been able to to cover uh, already, uh, such as them omitting what Saint Robert Pellman said about his the second opinion. Uh, you've been listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. God bless and Mary keep you. <laughs>